Now, uh, my pleasure to call upon uh, Dr. Aliza Levine from Haifa University, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, who's researched the area of age, marriage, divorce, and economic well-being of the elderly. And today we'll talk about uh, care and support in intimate relationships in later life. I got it right? Yes. So thank you. If this works, so I don't have to hold it. Works okay. What? No, not good. All righty. That better? Okay. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this workshop. The study I'm going to talk about today is currently under review in a journal, so it's still open for revisions, and I'll be happy to hear comments that might be helpful helpful for me in improving the paper. And um, I guess one spontaneous thing that it will be answered to Avia Spivak, you asked before, um, you mentioned about happiness coming back to where it was before. A uh, study that I did with Linda Waite and uh, Ye Lu, we looked at divorce and unhappiness after divorce. And we did find that after a period of crisis, that's about two years, people are as happy as they were before or as unhappy as they were before. But they, they go back to where they were um, beforehand, especially if they, uh, if they remarry. If they remarry, they'll be as happy in their second marriage, more or less, as they were in their first. And I didn't think about it before, but that is related to what I'm going to do today, so, it, uh, so, I, so I'm telling you about it. Uh, one last thing before I begin talking about my paper is that this paper is dedicated to my teacher, Valerie Oppenheimer, who introduced me to social demography. So how does, how does marriage compare to, with other types of a romantic relationship? Cherlin, who actually also was a student of Valerie Oppenheimer, um, argues that the main difference is enforceable trust, which allows individuals to invest in the partnership with less fear of abandonment. Now, he's referring to young people's incentives to make long-term ter joint investment. But I think this idea can be extended to trust and expectations of reciprocity, such as care and support at older ages. Um, caring for a partner and providing support in sickness and in health are normative expectations in marriage. But what about less committed romantic relationships? For example, a Swedish study found that men and women in non-cohabiting romantic relationships, which are called in the literature living apart together, and sometimes I'll even refer to it as LAT just to save characters, um, lap relationships, uh, they don't expect to provide care for their partner and they don't expect to receive it. This is in sharp contrast to studies that found that married people do expect to receive care from their spouse. There's even a hierarchy of care. So people expect care from their spouse and then from their children, then from other family members and then friends, acquaintances, even neighbors, and there's a, there's a hierarchy. Um, but there's also a gender aspect here. More husbands than wives expect to receive care from their spouses in, term, in times of illness, and these expectations do correspond to the receipt of care. Uh, studies show that, in fact, married men really do receive more hours of care than wives, uh, for, so, care from their wives than the married women receive from their husbands. So there's a gender effect. And many studies do compare the benefits of marriage for men and women. For example, in her book, The Future of Marriage, uh, Jesse Bernard argues that every marriage is composed of two marriages, his marriage and her marriage. And um, she says that while his marriage has many benefits, her marriage might be detrimental to her emotional well-being. And in her book, she reviews studies that find high rates of depression and suicide among married women compared to unmarried women. Um, now, the family has undergone changes since this book was written. Even between the first and second editions, she, she has to kind of do updates for the women entering the labor force. But, and the book has been criticized on many points, and it's certainly outdated in many respects. But still today, there's an agreement that men benefit more from marriage, at least as far as health is concerned. 
For example, in their more recent book, The Case for Marriage, Waite and Gallagher emphasized the benefits of marriage for both men and women. This book was criticized for being conservative, but even here they argue that, um, that the difference, that men and women different, benefit differently from marriage. Um, benef men benefit more um, in terms of health, and women benefit financially. So they argue that, they agree that the benefits of marriage differ for men and women, but they argue that in the final tally, married people are better off than unmarried people. Uh, the current study is theoretically grounded in this debate about the gendered benefits in ma from marriage, but it differs on two critical points. First, Bernard and Waite and Gallagher and many others ask whether marriage has benefits over being alone. But here in this paper, I argue that people who desire an intimate relationship have choices. They don't have, they, 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 they don't have to be married. They can cohabit or they can have a non-cohabiting romantic, romantic relationship, a latch. Uh, so in this study, I set out to investigate the implications of these choices, and I ask whether marriage has benefits over being in another type of romantic relationship. Now, studies of relationships later in life have emphasized the role of independence in seeking alternatives to, mar to remarriage, and here I ask whether this independence commands a price, and whether this price is gendered. The second difference between my study and Bernard and Witten Gallagher's and many others is that many previous studies look at the entire population, and here I focus on older adults. Focusing on older adults provides an opportunity to revisit theories of, ge uh, of gender differences in the gains from marriage. After all, these theories are based on a gender division of labor, which might change along the life course. Um, According to Becker, for example, the gains from marriage are maximized by a division of labor in the family, whereby one partner specializes in market production and the other in home production. Becker's assumption that the division of uh, labor in the family is beneficial for both men and women has come under attack. But even if we accept that marriage is beneficial to both men and women, the balance of these benefits might change with age. Most importantly for the current study, men and women may have different expectations of their roles and responsibilities after a marriage ends when they search for new partners and new relationships. For example, studies have found that older widows are more, much more hesitant to enter a new partnership than men because they enjoy their independence and they're reluctant to assume the role of caregiver and homemaker. Um, a study of LAT relationships among older adults in Sweden found that autonomy was a key motivation for maintaining separate households. Although partners in these relationships enjoyed long-term intimate relationships and emotional support, they emphasized boundaries and they maintained separate finances. This autonomy was more important for women than men. So this leads me to my research questions. Does independence command the price? Independence here I'm defining as foregoing marriage or looking for a, an alternative type of relationship, and the price is in terms of the quality of the relationship, in support in the relationship. And my next question is, does, this pri does the price of independence differ for men and women? Um, the data I'm using here um, is from the National Social Life and Hi Health and Aging Project, the NSHAP, from 2005-2006. NSHAP is a nationally representative sample of non-institutionalized older adults aged 57 to 85 in the United States. The study was funded by the NIH and the survey was conducted by NORC at the University of Chicago. Now NSHAP are particularly suited for the current investigation because they have detailed information on marital history and cohabitation history and what's unique is they have detailed information on other types of romantic relationship. And this provides me the opportunity to study these types of relationships, these non-cohabiting romantic relationships, which typically are invisible in survey data. And NSHAP also has measures of happiness in the relationship and relationship quality. And they have a question that, I, that I'm using here. This was a question that was intended just to know how prevailing um, the prevalence of having a medical decision maker. And I'm using it as a proxy for um, for relationship, with trust in the relationship. Um, the question is, do you have someone you would like to make medical decisions for you if you are unable, as, for example, if you were seriously injured or very sick? 
Um, and then they ask who this person is. So the medical decision make, maker could be the partner, but it could be somebody else, such as a child or another family member. Sometimes it's even a priest. Okay, the great majority of the sample is in second. I, I chose only people who are either in second marriages or higher. I excluded people who are not in a relationship, and I excluded people who were in their first marriages. So of, these, who, of those who are in mar uh, second marriages or other types of romantic relationships, of course the majority are in their second marriages or higher order, but most are second. Only 8% are cohabiting, and one-fifth, 20% are non-cohabiting. Um, the mean age was 68, and that's the same for it, all types of relationship. 37% uh, are women. What is different for different types of relationship is, of course, the duration. The mean um, second marriages are, on average, 22 years. The cohabitation is 13 years. And the non-cohabiting are 10 years. So these are not new relationships. These are still, they have, um, these are long-term relationships. I will control for a duration when I do my multivariate analysis. I'll add also... That cohabitants have the lowest level of religiosity on average, not surprising, followed by, by the non-cohabiting, and married people exhibit the highest levels of religiosity on average. There are no differences in the level of partner's mental health by relationship type. How many other things this subset? 700 and... That's the sample mm -hmm. The full sample is 3,000, and here I'm left with 772, I think, which I'll tell you. Okay, so let's look a little bit at um, dependent variables by relationship type. Here we see a happy, happiness in the relationship by uh, relationship type. The question was, how, uh, how happy are you in the relationship? And I, this is very happy and happy. The percent that say they are very happy or happy, people, this is a very skewed question. People tend to say that they're happy or very happy in the relationship. But we do see that marriages are happier than cohabitations and that are happier than the living apart together. We look at the question, how often can you open up to your partner? And I, I coded this to be very, very often. Also, we see um, second marriages have the highest openness, followed by cohabitations, followed by the living apart together. So the next question was, how often can you rely on your partner? And this is the answer is often. So also, um, here, cohabitations are a little bit higher. We'll see later that that's not significant. Cohabitations and second marriages can rely more than these living apart together. Okay, now to the medical decision made. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. The, uh, my data have also negative, not only positive things, but also negative things. So it's also how, how often can you re rely on your partner, but also how if the partner makes too many demands. And we see that here, demands, marriages have high, more demands than other types of relationships, actually. And another negative one is criticisms. Marriages also have more criticism. So, and the question was, how often do you have uh, there are too many? Does your partner criticize you? How often does your partner criticize you? And here it's often. What? <laughs> From my experience, later on, each person kind of puts themselves in where they are in the in this. Uh, it becomes personal. Okay. Now to the medical decision maker. Um, do you have a medical decision maker at all? We see that um, most people do. The married and cohabiting, it's 94 and 93 percent, almost everybody. The living apart together also, look at the scale here. So it's still most people do, it's 82 percent. But it's a lot less than the, the married people and the cohabitors, but it's still pretty high. Do you have a medical decision maker? It mean, what it says, no, it's if you were unable or seriously injured or very sick. This is a very extreme measure. I'm, I don't know if you have to because some people said no. I don't know. I know that they asked this because they wanted to know if people had it. They also, the question is sort of, uh, 
who you would like to make, not if you've nominated somebody. I don't know. It's a good question. But the next question is who this person is. Okay, and here I'm asking what percentage of people have their partner as their medical decision maker. Here we see a clear difference between uh, relationship types. 60% um, of marriages, or even more than 60% of marriages, which means that when we had 92% or 94%, lots of these people were, non were, were choosing their child, for example, or another family member. It's not always the partner. And we see cohabitants also, and the living apart together, very few choose their partner. Only 15% choose the partner. Most people must have somebody else. So if I summarize these uh, descriptives, and I just compare cohabiting versus second marriages, we can see that, okay, uh, it looks like cohabitants are less happy and have less support in medical crisis, but they also have fewer demands and criticisms. And non-cohabiting, if we compare non-cohabiting relationships with uh, second marriages, we can see that well, there, there are large differences, first of all. Marriages have higher levels of happiness and support, but they also have higher levels of demand and criticism. One possible explanation for this seeming discrepancy, how are they so happy and also and so many demands, is that demands mirror support in the relationship. In other words, the same relationships that provide high levels of support also demand high levels of support. So now let's look at differences by gender. And this is happiness in the relationship by gender. Um, we can see women are mostly are less happy than men in almost all types of relationship except the LAT where the difference is very small. And we're going to see this pretty much with all the measures. I won't go through all of them. I think I'm going to skip um, to the medical decision maker. Okay. So women are less happy. They have less rely. They can rely less. And but more uh, except in marriages, more women have a medical decision maker. And it, with the cohabitations, in fact, 100% of the women say they have a medical decision maker. It's only 30 cases. It's not very many, but there are more. Um, the living apart together, I think this is very meaningful that they have, the women have more than the men. So it suggests that these men who are living, um, in, in, who have, have these kinds of relationships are more isolated than the women. The women much have other sources of support. Uh, look at the, whether your partner is the medical decision maker, we can see that more men than women in every type of relationship uh, state their partner as their medical decision maker. And this we see in all types of relationships. So it's true that um, married people have uh, more have their partner, their, their medical decision maker than other types of relationships, but married men more than married women, cohabiting men more than cohabiting women, and living apart together men more than the women. So this is, and this is consistent. So if we summarize his relationship versus her relationship, men seem to be happier, they enjoy more support, support and they have more partners as medical decision makers but men report more demands and criticism I went through that one quickly and they fewer unmarried men than women have medical decision makers now I'll turn to a multivariate analysis I control for, for variables that might have an effect on the outcomes for example duration of the relationship might be related to support in the relationship so I, I'll control for that but I also want to control at least partly for selection into different types of relationship because that might also rela um, affect relationship quality. For example, I control for religiosity because religious people tend to choose marriage over cohabitation and they also tend to report higher rates of happiness in, in the United States at least. I also control for race, age, and education. Another variable I control for that turns out to be very interesting is partners' mental health. People with partners who suffer physical or mental disabilities might be assigned emotionally demanding, supportive, and caretaking roles, which might diminish happiness in the relationship. And they may also uh, experience stress and may feel that the relationship doesn't provide them with support. There's a lot of uh, research on the relationship between spouse's health and the relationship quality. 
And studies have found that the sick person reports better relationship quality than the sick person's spouse. I'm only going to show here the coefficients for, for the dependent variables that I care about, the, the relationship type. We see that um, men, cohabiting men are no different than uh, mar mar married men or men in second marriages, but uh, living apart together, the men are less happy and it's statistically significant. The women, I made this light yellow color, you can see, because it was borderline statistically significant. Openness, there's no difference. Relying, yes, there's no difference between the cohabitation and marriage, but there is a difference between the living apart together and marriage. Also men and also women, uh, in the, the odds of men and women in living apart together relationships of relying on their partner often are lower than the men and women in second marriages. Uh, with the demands and criticisms, first of all, it's interesting that it's only with men. We don't see a difference for women. Women, are, women in different types of relationships aren't, uh, there's no difference between by relationship type and marriage uh, in demands and criticism for women. Men in cohabiting relationships have lower odds of saying that their relationship has high demands compared to marriage. And criticisms, also men in cohabitations and also men in uh, living apart together, uh, report uh, Lower, have lower odds of saying they have high criticism, too many criticisms, than ma married men. Okay, medical decision maker. This is, uh, I think, maybe the most important finding. Um, men who are living apart together have lower odds than married men to have any medical decision maker. And men and women who are living apart together have lower odds of having their partner a medical decision maker. And also women in cohabiting relationships have uh, lower odds that their partner is a medical decision maker than married. So it looks like here there are differences by relationship type. Maybe the most consistent finding is that partner's mental health is a good predictor of happiness and relationship qui uh, quality of all the measures that I, that I looked at. But what is a mystery, and maybe someone here can offer an explanation, is why partner's mental health is not a significant predictor of the partner being the medical decision maker. Because I would have thought that it would be, and it isn't. So if you have an answer, I'd appreciate it. The limitations of the study. Uh, first of all, I assume no systematic differences in how men and women report happiness or demands and criticisms. If men just complain more, then, then maybe that's what this is going on. And, uh, there, of course, there are other factors that might affect happiness that I'm not controlling for, for example, income. There are other outcomes that I could be looking at, for example, depression or global happiness. Of course, like as, as it was said stated earlier today, global ha happiness might affect everything, and maybe I should be controlling for that and some kind of underlying explanation of what's going on. And of course, there's the selection into different types of relationship. I did try to control for that by controlling for all these independent variables, but there's always something that, I, that I'm not controlling for. Or there's a process there that I really, I'm trying to tap, but I'm not controlling for properly. So if I go back to my original research questions about the price of independence, the answer is yes, independence commands a price in terms of relationship quality. Married people tend to rely on their partner more than people in non-cohabiting relationships, also in everyday life and also in medical crisis. The expectation of care and support may not apply to less committed relationships. At the same time, cohabitation does not differ substantially from second marriages, and this finding is consistent with other studies of older adults. This is very different from younger adults where cohabitation is different uh, from marriage. The second question was whether the price of independence differs for men and women, and here too the answer is yes. The price of independence is gendered. His relationship is not as happy as her relationship if he's not sharing his home with her. The reason probably is because men benefit more from marriage than women, so the price of foregoing marriage is higher. These results also point to a complexity, or maybe a paradox, in partnership, partnership later in life. Because women might suffer a disadvantage because they benefit less than men from marriage later in life. But 
they have an advantage over men in that they may be better able to rely on other long-term ties as sources of support in times of crisis. For example, we saw that men in non-cohabiting romantic relationships seem to be relatively isolated in terms of having a medical decision maker compared to women who have other sources of support. With the increase in longevity and with more older Americans living in non-marital relationships, these findings have important implications for the study of health and well-being among the elderly. Thank you. Thank you.